Namaste to, namaste to everyone. This is Abhivardhan from Indus Think. And here we are with a very special dialogue as a part of Indus Think Season 1 with Amritan Shu, aka Amrit. You can find him on Twitter. So uh, I have been thinking of starting a very minute dialogue, a series of dialogue sessions, uh, like the panels that we've started on the civilizational state thing, like the one we did with Akshar, Ruchir, and others some months, few months ago, then we had a discussion with Jaisai Deepak, and now uh, we will be coming up with further discussions, but uh, we thought to start a series of dialogues, and we thought, okay, let's engage with some minds of Indic virtue and thought, and let's, okay, say, fine, you are interested in a particular issue, you have discussed those aspects, what are those aspects, how do you explore them from a policy point of view, and uh, from an aspect of cultural economy, cultural policy, cultural intelligence, how do you seek further? Because the very purpose of Indus Thing is to engage discussions and link things in a better way. So, um, Amrit, welcome to Indus Think. Happy to have you on board. And uh, for the information of the viewers, we are going to discuss a very interesting article on his uh, portal, Project Bharat, on Substack, if I'm right, which is yeah. uh, the Fractal Mandala. So uh, the very title of the article is The Fractal Mandala, A Macro Historic Case for India's Civilizational Prim Primacy. Now, of course, you have given it in the subtitle, not supremacy, <laughs> which is yeah. fine, uh, frankly speaking. Now, um, one thing is that India is an Asian state and India has one aspect that it represents the uh, religi re religio-cultural component of Asia. Uh, the Chinese religions have been inspired by Indian religions, or I would say Indic cultures, and uh, so so does the Indo-Chinese. Uh, so do the Indo-Chinese countries like Japan, Korea, Singapore, and so so forth. Indonesia also to add. So my first question to you is, with respect to your article, is how Asian is India really, according to your understanding of the article? If you give the macro historic case. And even if there is no one Asian identity, because we know that even when it comes to Asian political identity, there is a hell lot of disagreements. We are not getting into geopolitics particularly. But uh, my simple question is from a even a generic standpoint uh, for, I would say, cultural linkages. There are, of course, some commonalities, but of course, that doesn't go to that higher level. Uh, because uh, if there is no one Asian identity, what happens is that at least one stereotype is broken that all Asians are considered to be, you know, collectivist or autocratic in that sense, because uh, the Asian, the Asian himself or herself, or as we say, actually has been in a particular system which is plural and structurally fractal, as you say the word fractal. So, how should we approach it according to your proposition, which is the fractal mandala, within which you can explain why did you actually give a macro historic case? And why is it that it is not a micro historic case? Why why do you think of that? So, over to you. Right. Well, uh, firstly, namaste everyone. Uh, namaste Abhivardhan. Thank you. Uh, very happy and uh, very humbled to be here. Uh, as I've mentioned to you, but also for the benefit of listeners, I am an Indus Think fanboy. So, uh, uh, even on this count of you know India and Asia, uh, in fact, it is dialogues on the Indo-Pacific, dialogues on Indo-Europe. Uh, which I got familiarized with through your forum, you know, people such as you, uh, Ruchir, Akshay, Kartikeya. So uh, these are things that, in fact, are seeding my thoughts as well. Uh, when you mentioned this, the first thing that also did come to mind is that we can ask this question both ways right now, that how Asian is India or how Indian is Asia, where how Asian is India might be a geopolitical and currently relevant question, but how Indian is Asia? is a historically and uh, uh, you know historically culturally relevant question which is to say that asia as this geographic entity uh, is just that right it's just this geographic demarcation whereas uh, through the course of world history human history uh, the movement has been uh, far more malleable and uh, uh, these uh, the lines haven't been existent you know just as a small uh, point on that note uh, uh, I read that when you look at the maternal DNA of Japan, then you find that the earliest maternal uh, DNA of Japan originated in India uh, sometime after the last glacial maximum. So that was 25,000, 28,000 years ago. And uh, clearly there has been cross-pollination and there have been people moving around for a long time. 
but when you see earliest maternal dna it means that this was the first wave of uh, settlers there because when uh, people move to a new piece of land that's when both uh, men and women move so that's when maternal dna also transfers but when people move to an existing already inhabited land it tends usually to be males who uh, migrate and settle in the new land so uh, what this means to what this shows us is that the connections between this entire uh, land that we are calling asia uh, which itself in indian thought uh, comprised of jambu dweep Shalmali Dweep uh, and Kronch Dweep, uh, if we look at Puranic geography. People have known about this for a long time. People have been moving around for a long time. And uh, even in modern day Japan, you know, we have uh, uh, versions of Saraswati, of, uh, of Ganesh. And of course, we find a lot of this in Thailand, in Malaysia, etc. Uh, the, the thought that I have on this count is that uh, before India starts to wonder how Asian are we, or rather even on the other direction, how Indian is Asia, how Indian is India, uh, we will have to begin there. Uh, whether we speak of something like the Indo-Pacific, something like the Indo-European, I think what is uh, it is all being premised upon a strong and independent India. And we may find reasons to articulate that, yes, we are such today, but we do know through all of these conversations we are a part of in decoloniality, etc., that we are not also in many ways a strong and independent nation. And if we ask ourselves that, are we on a position where from strength and confidence we can interact with all different nations, then perhaps we have some way to go. Uh, but what I think is the good thing is that a strong India will not be a bullying India. I don't think so. A strong India would rather, it would in fact be an empowering India, uh, which is maybe similar to how India has, uh, you know, invested in infrastructural projects in Afghanistan. And it is, uh, uh, of course, it's a modern world. We're not going to remove economics from it, but it is almost like a selfless uh, uh, interest, right? I mean, we are contributing to the infrastructural development there. We're educating the students over here. It's not that we are conditionally imposing some returns as well, that, OK, this and this has to come back. So it, this is in line with India's uh, historical and ancient position as a beacon, as a lighthouse in this geography that we may demarcate as Asia. So uh, that is what I think in terms of this India and Asia question. Uh, we currently, I don't think we can say we are Asia per se. Number one for the West, right? When they speak of Asians, they're actually speaking of further East. So they're speaking of Asians after India uh, when you go further East, right? So uh, in any case for the world right now, I don't think India and Asia are the same or interchangeable. They're in fact somewhat different entities. But yes, uh, we will first have to be, I think, more India, more Bharat uh, to use uh, the relevant and topical uh, notions that we are in uh, conversation with these days that let India become Bharat first uh, fully and strongly. And I think a lot of things will organically flow, flow from there anyway. So, for example, India becoming Bharat will involve a lot of architectural revivalism uh, for which maybe we can turn to Asian countries where it has been preserved to some degrees uh, in Indonesia, in Vietnam and learn from that in, in Thailand. You know, so maybe there are aspects of Bharat that are lost in India. But somehow they seeped in and uh, still exist in some forms in Asia. So eventually all of that has to be corralled back and it has to be, uh, you know, stewarded again. So that role, of course, I think uh, uh, Bharat will be poised to, uh, to play. Uh, surely in terms of geopolitics, where I, I will admit this is something uh, I don't dive into too deeply. I wouldn't claim I, I, I'm just... Uh, an opinionated person when it comes to geopolitics, not an informed person. So surely there's a lot of interplay with China, the other great uh, civilization state. Uh, but again, there too, I think that a strong Bharat and uh, and China would have a very different equation and dynamic than what India and China have today. So uh, that is on that question. And this then uh, segueing into the fractal mandal, which yes, it's uh, it's it's catchily titled and uh, deliberately so, so because uh, I mean let's put it this way it's clickbait. I say titled. it's more math mathematical and topographical at the same time. Sorry, topological at the same time. So <laughs> indeed it is. Indeed it is. Yes. So and uh, there are points we can come to on that front as well. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, this was just an intuition that first developed once I started researching into the Purans, uh, into Itihas, into the Vedas. 
uh, I also started talking to certain uh, traditional scholars and experts. And I had this one experience where uh, the Guruji, uh, uh, he kind of really put me down in the way that he said that, what are you trying to achieve? When you're making all of this chronology, when you're trying to find out, oh, this is when Ramayan happened, this is when Mahabharat happened, what will that get you? And will you be able to do this uh, conclusively for all of humanity? That whatever you come up with now, that will become some kind of hard science and everyone will accept it? No, not really. And so that opened the door to me towards realizing that history is important for the lessons we can learn from it. That is always what is, has been told to us as kids. So yes, there is an academic field of history which because of its academic nature, we'll have to also discuss which year, who ascended, what economic policy, when. But uh, in the larger sense for you and I, for uh, general individuals, it's about what can we learn from the lives of our ancestors? That's what history is. And when I started looking at it from that level, then I started finding that there are essentially, the, it's the same mission, it's the same engagements, it's the same endeavors that are being shown to us in all of our stories, uh, whether it's of avatars, whether it's of Chakravartins, uh, whether if it's of all of these tribes, Puranic wars, uh, Rig Vedic wars. So uh, we can break it down, fractal and mandal. So fractal, uh, as you said, and if it, if the nature of a fractal, like a snowflake, it's like at whatever level you zoom in, you will be finding the same things. You will be finding the same pattern. And uh, I can pinpoint to certain examples uh, from our literature, which highlighted that to me but a fractal in itself uh, is still an abstract description you have to have something that makes it whole which is that you have to have something that gives it a meaning or at least a message and that's where i added the second term mandal uh, in fact and you know just yesterday uh, i learned this from uh, mr raghav krishna who is on uh, twitter he is the dean and uh, co-founder of rashtram school for public leadership and he mentioned uh, multi-level coherence and I immediately thought that, okay, this is a great descriptor. So fractal is the multi-level part. It's at every level, at every zoom layer. But multi-level what? And the mandal uh, uh, alludes to coherence. It alludes to a, a worldview that is cohesive uh, and that is in tune with reality. So of course, this is where it will uh, dive into rit and dharm. We can get there. But that is what I mean by a fractal mandal. Uh, the same truth, the same wholeness, uh, embedded at to every layer, every aspect of civilization. And why macro historical, not micro historical? Uh, well, firstly, it's easier. Uh, it's far easier to take the Neolithic revolution in broad and speak of it in broad than to say that, okay, something like the Mahabharat happened on this and this day. This is when Krishna died. This is when Bhishma passed away, etc. Uh, and I mean, I'm not dismissing uh, those endeavors as well. Uh, due credit there and uh, more power there as well. But in terms of the learnings for us, in terms of this mission that we've just articulated, that what, what was the life of our ancestors and what we can learn from those lives, in that limited sense, it doesn't matter whether the Ram Mahabharat happened in 1900 BC or whether it happened in 3102 BC. The lessons will still, the questions will be still the same that have you learned from the journey of Arjun? Have you learned from the journey of Karma? For whoever you are in your life and your position, are there characters in the Mahabharat that you resonate with, that you relate with, and whose own life experiences or journey can inform you in your own life experience and journey? So, in, 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 our, in so far as that is our mission, we can, uh, we can look at it macro historically. And in fact, diving into the micro historic levels uh, will have its own relevance and its aliens, yes. But for this purpose, to understand the, the dharmic trajectory and what our learnings should be, uh, I think macro history is, uh, is good enough. And uh, it avoids then you know, the debates that inevitably will come if you get into micro history. That's quite interesting to say and to start with, I must say. So. Uh, since you've explained the concept of fractal mandala, uh, it is very, uh, I would say, cognizant and very conscious, I would say, when it comes to what you're trying to propose. So uh, my first question is, and uh, this is something which I'm quoting the book mm -hmm. India that is Bharat to some extent, mm -hmm. not an exact one, because I'm saying that it has been stated in the book in the very introductory portion where uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee basically, you know, and other thinkers who were a part of the Constituent Assembly, 
they actually were very clear with their idea of india that mm. india that is india that is bharat as per article 1 yeah. of the indian constitution is actually kind of a federal civilization and this term india as a federal phrase india as a federal civilization has been i don't know if it is coined for the first time by jay sai deepak but let's say he has done it because i found it first according to me but it could have been done by somebody else also in some other way but uh, i found his description quite reasonable because mm-hmm. of federal civilization by federal civilization in the last episode that we had before the one we had on hindi divas um uh, jay sai explains that you know there are various tributaries and you know then yeah. there are lakes and rivers and so on and that structuralization is very pretty clear now uh it is very ironic to say and i agree with that because uh from a practical experience it seems that yes there is a particular relationship of that sort but for somebody who has uh, who has a very uh, post colonial and i'm not using post colonial or decolonial in this talk too much but i'm saying from a perspective of you know learning and how you see things uh, not from a perspective of these particular schools of thought but like from a way of a normal person who you know who has that feeling that fine you know what i have heard in my stories in puranic stories that you know what there was something called bhugol we never believed in or have we have never Absolutely. had an idea of a flat earth common sense again yeah. right uh, we we understood the concept of water cycle uh, mm-hmm. we never had to <laughs> rely on a newton or copernicus i'm not saying they had no achievement but fine it is theirs sure. it's yeah. their problem fine yeah. but still we had that uh, conscious experience that is what our uh, i would say our amor with itihasas has been but okay fine mm-hmm. we have this connection we feel it yes we we get that uh highlighted understanding but still uh you know of course we just can't say fine it is everything because again the problem comes in that people just think that uh, understanding uh, culture when it comes to uh, it starts from the idea of ideology which is actually mm-hmm. not true because ideology itself is simply a notion of power and competence and not a notion of culture all the time although ideologies like marxism and so so forth create cultures but again they are artificial cultures they are not natural like top down top down cultures top, yeah. top down top down cultures exactly so uh, of course the, uh, it, it happens with liberalism happens with the uh, feudal conservatism also <laughs> british conservatism most modern isms actually <laughs> so. most modernism yeah. yeah most modern ideas so uh, so uh, it's not an ideology but it, because but that is pretty clear that's why my next question is more on the aspect of an individual that hmm. uh, it is a very in weird stereotype which is made about asian countries especially india that okay fine uh, you are india you are china you are south korea or you are any asian country uh you will be too much collectivist and the, the role of the individual is not present but mm-hmm. if we look at the role of various people uh where whether, whether it is based on any particular social system i'm not getting on social systems at all but i'm saying howsoever they still have retained the individual character of course there will be people who will mess it up sometime and we will of course find proofs of them that's a different issue but it does not mean that uh, the individual character actually has not been even appreciated for that matter as compared mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. other places because uh, mm-hmm. if we would have said then we would have said everyone in the uh, everyone in america is uh, christian <laughs> we would have said everyone in saudi arabia is radical and we would have said everyone in soviet union is a, a radical uh, i don't know what bolshevik whatever but mm-hmm. that's not how things work dissenters are there normal people are there there are various thoughts all together in the world and there are always realist approaches so from a realist perspective from a more realist perspective on the perspective of your work how do you see the role of an individual in the bharatiya civilization uh you mm-hmm. can give examples of the kings you can give examples of artists you can give examples of warriors whoever you have and you can elaborate so my question was long sorry for that but i no. just wish to make some background for the viewers yeah yeah uh, you know so uh, when you were talking about also uh, sai deepak's book uh, and uh, the uh, federal structuralism one thing that came to mind in fact i might have heard this from one of sai deepak's videos itself or from somewhere else a comparison between uh, a melting pot and a khichdi and india is often called a melting pot which is in fact the wrong way to describe it because uh, in in a melting pot all things uh, coalesce and become the same homogeneous unit that's what a melting pot is so all the ingredients have lost their color their identity and it's just this one thing whereas in a khichdi there are different ingredients that retain their character that retain their nature but together they make something that is more than the sum of their parts so i think 
yes, we should be clear in accepting that for India, first of all, we are not targeting a melting pot. We have never been a melting pot. We are a khichdi. Now, first of all, when someone who doesn't know a khichdi has to describe a khichdi, they can only find general ways to describe it. So they will not be able to dive down to the level of understanding the nuances to the khichdi. So the khichdi will get one general description, which will be a very homogeneous description. And that that will be for the cognitive ease of the external observer who's describing the khichdi. But that has nothing to do with the khichdi's felt experience, so to speak. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Western trajectory has been such that they have found civilizational identity through a top down imposition of individual identity. So, yes, today all Americans may not be Christian. But the Western civilization has reached here by grabbing everyone by the collar and telling them, hey, you're Christian, so be a Christian. And that's what you are. Uh, and of course, I'm saying this reductively. I'm saying this uh, crudely. Uh, we're eliminating nuances of history. But in broad, because this is how they have found their identity, uh, th th they think that this is how every other civilization would have identity as well, that if all of you do not collectively believe in exactly the same things, then that means you are not one people. So uh, the role of an individual itself, it becomes a question to my mind half because we're thinking from the Western lens, you know, questions like the role of an individual in, in the Indian civilization, for, for example, I think it was more about the purpose, the duty and the fulfillment of an individual. Now, if you find a purpose, if you do your duty and if you are fulfilled, then it doesn't matter what the role of the individual was, because then you are anyway organically not just contributing to the whole, but also taking from the whole. Uh, so, for example, uh, you, you said if we could uh, talk about uh, uh, what you say, uh, ancient examples. So uh, uh, take the case of this uh, conqueror called Kartavirya Arjun. Now, in all Puranic descriptions, you will find he was he was called a Samrat. He was called a conqueror. Clearly, he had a lot of imperial victories. But there is no glory for him. There is no laudation of this individual. So in ancient India, anyone who you know, chased conquest or monarchy for the sake of conquest or monarchy, uh, there is no glory for that person. Now, you contrast it with someone like Sagar, who uh, you know, he was exiled. He was born in an ashram. And in fact, he was born in an ashram, I think, of a Karnva Rishi. I could be wrong here. but. Uh, he's born thinking that this Rishi is his father. And so one day his mother tells him his true identity, etc. And then the people of Ayodhya, when he's of age, they come to him and they tell him that, look, this is your purpose. We are without a leader and we need someone who can come, uh, you know, uh, helm us back again, who can win back our city and who can take the fight to our enemies. Now, this is where Sagar, uh, number one, he's uh, uh, submitting to his dharma, to his duty. But number two, he is also fulfilling uh, imperial uh, uh, motivations. He is also now going on conquest. So he is waging war. He is expanding territory. He is forming a federal empire. And you see this that he, he with various Yadav tribes of his time, it's not like he conquers their empires. He just maintains a federal alliance that, yes, you are also on the side of Dharma. I am also on the side of Dharma. Your rishis are my rishis. My rishis are your rishis. Let us not be nasty to each other. Let us not do what the Hayas did or then we will have to use a different solution. So the role of an individual, I think, is the lesser question, uh, perhaps uh, from the Indian civilization's point of view. It is the place of an individual in the larger collective. And yes, so that this individual is not buried under the collective to the individual in, in, uh, through these accessible texts like Purans and Itihas, the, the Purusharths are given. Because it is understood that the individual has to be fulfilled, you know, and so I, I put this in the paper this way that there is no happy jana or happy collective without happy jeeves or happy individuals, you know, so uh, you will need to create happy individuals so that eventually you are also a happy collective. So it is the fulfillment part that's more important, but it is uh, it doesn't take it to the extent that, you know, OK. Uh, uh, to the extent of modern civilizations, individualism and liberalism, right, where, uh, you know, I am more important than everything else. And, you know, it's almost a solipsistic individualism that we are moving towards. So that wasn't the case, definitely in ancient civilization, uh, especially because in any case, as humans, we understood that we are part of a larger system. 
you know so we didn't see ourselves as separate from nature right therefore animals weren't our property for example they were also equal life forms and so similarly within the collective i am not separate from the larger collective uh, my fulfillment cannot be buried but i must uh, be cognizant of my contribution also uh just one interesting follow up i ha i wish to have uh kind of an intervention i wish to seek is that uh, you mention individualism which mm -hmm. is uh, particularly i am very much interested in because of the simple thing that uh, i have simple critiques on the way individualism and collectivism is understood okay and of i gave my critique that you know what collectivism is there and so so forth but the larger issue with individualism has been that it actually even under from a legal perspective even from a international human rights perspective it has mostly been focusing on a very uncontrolled form of self exploitation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. somehow for example uh i will not mention the profession but uh, in your a particular aspect of thing is that okay fine you do certain activities then yes there should be some particular control now under mm -hmm. in europe what happens the concept of positive law play, takes a role uh, especially where uh, i'm not getting on common law common law is a different system altogether so in uh, positive law it's a top down approach simple you just have human dignity from a moral perspective which is and the more the, the moral fountain is the state that grants you either it is mm -hmm. the european convention of human rights which is through council of europe or it is the european uh, court of justice which is again the european union which is again mm -hmm. a civilization state of europe a mosaic of different lingual cultures yep. now interestingly even in the united states there is brandenburg versus ohio which is for a mm -hmm. very uh, uh, funny kkk uh, not funny i would say very uh, infamous kkk rally wherein it was uh, so because there the right and left can works there so there the, uh, there was a particular rally and for their freedom of speech particularly this judgment was upheld that fine brandenburg was ohio comes in that is how the first amendment came in and that is how they give their justification right uh, but what happened after 1990s when the wto era bloomed and you know uh, neoliberalism became prevalent there was a unipolar world clinton and then bush particularly what happened was that individualism became a commercial thing consumerism hmm. which is the reagan form of approach to competition law and the reagan approach to consumer welfare that actually seeped in individualism that is why we see apps like clubhouse and other things now uh, one problem which comes in and it is something which uh, of course uh, unfortunately china is also not uh, being very asian when it comes to individual values because if you mm -hmm. see the tiktok app for example uh, mm -hmm. it has a very severe issue that if you use it its recommendation algorithm is highly discriminatory and second its recommendation algorithm actually has a way to number one self uh, make people self exploit which is again against individual individualization or individual rights because then you are forcing somebody to exploit themselves so mm -hmm. if, there, if there is individual autonomy let them be right for example if i am on twitter i am not reacting i might not get virality i might mm -hmm. not get virality like the 2011 ps5 gangnam style video but at the end of the day my virality is upon me right that is how algorithms work but i un unfortunately that is how the uh, even uh, tiktok declares who are ugly and who are not ugly now i actually mm. took this example of technology directly because people understand technology directly if i would have taken anything else it would not have been direct so with this i think uh, it's a very good opportunity for india and other asian countries to see where individualism could be taken forth from a perspective of responsibility as well as i would say portability how portable it is how 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 reasonable it is and how can it actually be existent in a practical way because again mm -hmm. the same problem mm -hmm. will come in from a legal point of view that the rights based approach has its own flaws the problem is not giving rights the problem is that the fountain head of uh, protecting rights is something thing which is not working pretty well or the jurisprudential understanding is very heavily based on only the western uh, mm. blocks particularly that's why the whole problem comes in uh but I'm, of course uh, we will discuss individualism in some other talk otherwise uh, mm -hmm. this time will go away uh, ahead in a very weird way now uh, i have a question on samudra manthan so i found mm -hmm. that uh, you explained the problem of multiple tribes and the question of ethos i'll get on the question of bharata uh, bharatiya ethos but um, uh, considering the example of samudra manthan mm -hmm. you say that uh, it was an attempt to come up with a sustainable working solutions 
and right. uh, you know you gave it in the, the aspect of multiple tribes so mm-hmm. why do you think so and if you can give a little bit few examples on the same really happy to know sure yeah so samudra manthan uh, well and again this came through my research of puranic uh, events and chronology and uh, without linking them to real timelines just when i started placing them in an internal chronology so we know that we started the first manvantar with swayambhu manu then you know the daityas and adityas come and the purans actually remember 12 daitya aditya wars so they are called dev asura wars and the 12th of them in fact happens at the beginning of the seventh manvantar so they start in the beginning of the first manvantar but they keep going uh, throughout and there are 12 great such wars samudra manthan is one of those wars now when you look at the samudra manthan story uh, uh, first of all it is the only story where there are actually two avatars uh, you put broadly because in the samudra manthan uh, uh, on the daitya side is mahabali now before the samudra manthan mahabali has already had a story where he was this great king uh, and uh, vaman incarnated and uh, you know uh, took the land and exiled him right so all of this has already happened before the samudra manthan and he this has happened supposedly because the adityas are not happy with the growing power of the daityas and so vaman uh, incarnates and against the warning of shukra uh, who is mahabali's guru uh, he you know still is very generous and he gives everything to to vaman and then he's exiled but now even with bali exiled it turns out that the adityas still aren't able to really reclaim their lost glory and uh, of course uh, there are elements of mythology in this which uh, you know i don't think anyone can explain one way or the other so for example uh, the story is that okay the adityas uh, the daityas literally have something which is amrit which is an elixir of immortality so they are killed in battle but they keep getting resurrected apparently by shukra uh, by shukracharya and so the adityas decide that they too need this and therefore more of such thing has to be churned out and that is the samudra manthan story but to do this they need bali again so they can't do it on their own so now mahabali is uh, invited back that from his exile that please come back and let us please do this now firstly i think here itself we can notice one thing you know there are many speculations for where mahabali was exiled so the, the word itself is that he was exiled to patal what does that mean so a uh, uh, folk etymology could make you suggest that oh there's a potal palace in lhasa so maybe he was exiled to lhasa uh, you could say that geographically you know uh, the southern coastline of india up to the coastline that runs into myanmar etc down to thailand that was what was looked at patal and so that is where he was exiled now there are these uh, i would say ludicrous theories that place patal at the other end of earth in south and central america but that's just a historical because why would even if we imagine that bali can go and exile get exiled there why would he then come all the way back to do some kind of ocean churning here so clearly bali was still in the same area where there are shared resources and shared interests which is why he's called back for this so that's point number 1 number 2 that this is the first, when you look at all this chronology that's happening all the wars that have preceded this is the first instance you find of the daityas and adityas saying hey let's relax let's stop fighting let us try to do something together and when they do do something together which is the samudra manthan we find that this is now where we find instances of airavat coming out of of the uh, the churning of uchaishravas which is the horse coming out of the churning lakshmi which is wealth itself and prosperity itself personified coming out of the churning so therefore when i think of this in a macro historical way and you know so bali's story is placed in the 6th manvantar which is just preceding our own and also if you look at it chronologically then that means it's just a little time before prithu venya's era which is also in the 6th manvantar so we know that these eras were relatively close by uh, there are uh, reasons i won't detail into why prithu venya can very clearly be linked to a neolithic revolution and therefore i reason that the samudra manthan is a proto neolithic revolutionary attempt so even in this time there are no cities the way the purans describe you can clearly understand that organized agriculture hasn't really come about that settled living urban living hasn't really come about but yes these tribes that have been amorally and viciously fighting and warring for a long time generation after generation you know bali's great 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 grandfather fought with a different indra his uh, another ancestor prahlad fought with a different indra 
by bali's time it's mantra drum in but the wars are going on except now they settle down uh, of course during the uh, uh, amrit uh, when amrit comes out then there is still more conflict that happens which makes sense it's not like in one shot everything can be solved but if you do look at the trajectory you find that yes after generations of war finally on this side shukra on this side brihaspati they talk amongst themselves they encourage their people that listen we need to coexist we need to share these resources so okay and so it's metaphorically shown to us that oh the domesticated elephant is taken by the adityas the domesticated horse it's taken by the daityas etc so therefore i think it does represent uh, the uh, the uh, attempt to reconciliation to developing a shared ethos now to this uh, i do add a bit of folk etymology i don't think it's correct but i i like it so i'm going to stick with this narrative nevertheless that the final thing they churn out is amrita now amrita is a mrita which is uh, you know a mrit and mrit itself i define as the crumbling of rit so mrit means the end of rit and therefore amrit means that which will uphold rit eternally therefore amrit is this elixir of immortality but immortality of what of rit and since i also define dharm as the attempt and not just me in fact i mean this ideas that i have taken from lot of people so this is not originality of thought here at all but dharm itself is the attempt to live in consonance with rit with the eternal order therefore amrit itself was actually a kind of dharmic formulation it was the emergence of the ideas of co-living of sharing of conciliation of, of mutual respect etc and so that is why i speak of the samudra manthan this way and very quickly yes there are other examples it happens all over again uh, during the rigvedic era in the time of uh, it comes to a head in the time of sudas which we can find very tangibly in the rigved uh, so he comes by his time again it's a whole new tribal order situation the daitya and adityas are in fact now you know ancestral tribes and becoming so ancestral that they can be mythified so they become you know gods and demons within the rigvedic uh, mythology so to speak though there are of course many layers of rigvedic interpretation also but in in sudas time uh, again it happens and so you, we may probably come to it right so he his tribal totem crudely and reductively speaking is indra his rivals is varun uh there are great conflicts for shared resources for the same places for the same rivers etc and then emerges vasisht who does something similar to what happened during the samudra manthan era and again he tries to find a uh, you know a reconciliation between these disparate uh, disparate tribes these different world views so again it happens but at a at a higher level of civilization now because by this era it's it's a settled living has come about uh, you know organized agriculture, agriculture has come about so the problem of sharing resources is far more stuck you know if, when you didn't have organized agriculture there was no grain to share but now you have grains and you have grain storages so you have to share them or people will come uh, claiming them now you've domesticated animals so people will come stealing your cattle so all of these problems become far more stuck and we see another solution being attempted there is one another myth uh, i do think i have read about this uh, from kiran's threads if i'm not mistaken at the rate wakibs for the listeners so i think he mentions the tanutra myth uh, if i am not mistaken and that is another similar story of uh, some ancient indian tribes uh, finally attempting uh, a working solution and sustainable solution for co-living and cooperation so and of course this is why i also call it the bharatiya ethos because that has been our way time and time again and you know uh, i think we have our a uh, jewish and parsi countrymen to uh, testify to that uh, for, for, from the recent times indeed so uh, a very interesting description that you have given on the various kinds of myths involving the very event of samudra manthan and uh, the very structuralization that you have given as to how it is understood in many ways in fact uh, if uh, when vakif see the, sees this of course he's in, he can clarify you personally or maybe for sure yeah. like via tweet <laughs> so um now um i have a question from a perspective of expression <laughs> now be it as it may and this is something which is an achievement and i'm not saying it's a complete achievement but it is something because uh, as uh, as i quote jsi deepak uh, mm-hmm. you can't just claim that everything has come from you 
so this is something which is like fine um it's not that just uh, asians uh, have that perfectly because yes asians had issues but yes they mastered something the west did in a different way for example i can give the best example of japan but still that's mm-hmm. a different question altogether so this specific question is regarding freedom of expression now what has happened is that uh, in general in the west freedom especially of expression and i'm only talking about freedom of expression right away because of the simple reason that is this is something which will be a contested value asset and not from a perspective of i would say the fiduciary the fiduciary or the top down approaches of liability because again uh, let's let let us take a simple example if somebody uh, does any particular activity which is not considered reasonable under law then of course there is some attracted liability therefore the expression is under a particular retributive action that is the simple mm-hmm. approach to criminal law i'm not saying it and it happens everywhere like that but generally the cardinal stick mostly has been in the west but again i don't wish that it should be generalized because even there are some nuanced approaches and there are no no nuanced approaches in some cases but still let us say it has been a problem uh, yet uh, it has been historically true that the west has at least tried to extrapolate and master it but what has happened is that digital and metaphysical metaphysical and i say metaphysical in a very responsible way digital and metaphysical feudalism has been created because uh, hmm. of the simple reasons what we see on social media and not be not just social media even when it comes to disruptive technologies accessibility um uh, companies uh, mostly from the united states do not want the, that new unicorns come in who get actually take away their profits or something let's say get into their own ecosystem you know mm-hmm. having more indian or chinese startups or having more uh, korean or japanese or i don't know nigerian or kenyan mm. startups but anyways uh so they create hostages of value and knowledge assets so for example uh, uh you must have heard of a very interesting incident a few years ago that uh, the marketing budget of the very uh, important companies who are under unilever that got down mm-hmm. to facebook which is very ironic because facebook is the master of uh, ads and marketing ads, uh, yeah. Am- amazon also does that to some extent mm-hmm. amazon and facebook do it amazon has a different issue jeff bezos and his company will see he's not in the company anymore but still mm-hmm. we all know what it is but mm-hmm. uh, with facebook the reason is reason, reasonable problem is that uh, Uh, Unilever companies have actually taken back the ad campaign from Facebook, which is a huge loss for them. Why it hmm. is? Because unlike the de- distributed ledger-based social media, which is a decentralized form of social media, it is a feudal one. Heavy control at the top, therefore democratization not happening. Language bias, of course, is there. Therefore, if anyone is emerging, for example, if anybody says to me that, uh, you know, I don't know how many followers are there on YouTube, the subscribers on T series, I don't know, but if you have them. uh show me any data which which shows that uh, more than 40% of the subscribers are not from india show me one data mm, okay. if so, anybody shows it to me most of it will be indians more mm-hmm. than 50% let alone 70% i'm guessing it i may sure. be wrong but i'm guessing it right why mm-hmm. it is because it is because of the population that is there or actually the subscribers have gone access to it it's not because that the world has accepted you faster yeah there yeah. are two things which are different here so even that happens with the freedom of expression conception that freedom of expression itself is extrapolated and you know put under a cage of hostages various form of hostages and that has been hmm. a problem for the west for long right uh, somehow in india also we have tried to <laughs> imitate them and that's why we have got into a very fishy situation like you know somebody says something xy he gets contempt or jailed <laughs> then we say hmm. freedom of expression problem comes in and why am i asking this i'm asking this because expression is a very important asset for a society Yeah. more than an individual actually individual yes but society more because then it shows how uh, <coughs> how your historical aspirations are to be taken into consideration and of course how your uh, how your coherence develops with time you know how your traditions form and how these things matter because this is a very mm. mysterious question most of the time yes there can be uh, dharmic understandings from this you know basic philosophical scriptures how vad or vivad should happen uh, purva paksha and uh, utar paksha how, how the conception works the structure works uh, i have seen discussions on them but taking that uh, how do you think uh, according to your approach which you're giving in this because you talk about expression to some extent uh, since india i consider it is a it's still a cultural spiritual abode of asia when it comes to you know culture and religion uh, has dealt with freedom of expression from hmm. 
you know uh, from a point of view of interoperability because if freedom of expression is not interoperable then it does not work because in the west i'm just giving one last indication there's a very very funny concept which is coming known as freedom of reach now logistically and even Sorry, from a perspective of, of freedom of reach okay. reaching out so for example if i'm speaking something i uh, you can just have a, uh, you know an airport or something like that i don't know and you can just uh, have a noise cancellation button it just hmm. cancels all the environment voice the voice is coming you are just not hearing so you have just stopped the reach Mm -hmm. considering that they came up with this american idea but it is severely failing because the question is it's again a human agency it's a human issue of human interoperability because mm -hmm. again if it is too much extrapolated with the notion of power and competence it's not freedom of expression it is manipulated information warfare so yep, considering yep, that yep. exactly so considering that how bharat has dealt with it uh, have there been issues or have there been successes how they have done it you can explain through the conversations of you know experts of those times or you can explain through other ways so uh well i would i would probably just think aloud on this more i don't think i have uh, well considered thoughts about it uh for one uh, there are a few points you touched here uh, i think we have to uh, have a fundamental understanding that the the notion of freedom of expression comes only when there is uh the the crushing of expression to begin with when there are limitations to expression to begin with that's when it, that's when as a counter thought it arises that oh wait we should have freedom of expression now it, indian trajectory i don't think has had that quashing of expression bit ever at all you know there was just one there was to add just one thing to add please. i'm so sorry to intervene you very rightly pointed out in fact that is the western conception yeah. i say i offend you by something x y z i don't wish to I'm just saying example people will respect it anyhow because that is freedom of expression but it's a different question whether it is considered to be offense from a power perspective because again it is if somebody says something why is it mm -hmm. that a defamation case is filed at the first place because mm -hmm. there is a power mm -hmm. question right there is an economics question power and competence mm -hmm. problem but if mm -hmm. in, in imagine if there is actually no power and competence involved and i'm not talking about personal issues of ego and all of that i'm talking about general issues from a public perspective private perspective mm -hmm. is a different question that is mm -hmm. more of a psychological and interpersonal perspective i'm not getting into it but from a public perspective i'm saying somebody the person let's say doesn't have a power competence angle at all like for example any uh, person in an msme like a chai wala or a particular vendor or you know mm -hmm. who is selling something and you just or pan wala you just shouting at them but a person doesn't care just does it work and says okay fine yeah, yeah take it and we also used to have the culture of which is where uh, you know multilingualism comes in that you know what fine we have multiple, multiple languages we used to criticize but fine the criticism part was not connected with this feudal aspect of power so mm -hmm. if we have to delink them because uh, freedom of expression stays when the notion of power is not connected problem is most of your uh, legal debates which happen are based on the notion of power because of the simple reason that uh, most foe clarion calls are based on the notion of based on information warfare they are not to be mm. justified like for example somebody says something they do it for algorithmic liking or uh, they do it for special ulterior motives i don't wish to discuss that and of course then uh, when they are jailed oh wow freedom of expression so it's all, that's why the left right system is created otherwise there is no left right system particularly in asia in fact in africa also so uh now uh, you explain uh, yeah i mean so but uh, you see even uh, the, you just pointed out to an example here about someone getting jailed and then we cry about freedom of expression but even there it's very selective i mean that i think itself we should separate to this weird kind of political ideological situation happening in india today you know i mean there is a gentleman i think by the name of sanal adamaru uh, and i hope i'm not getting his name wrong he is in exile in finland since 2011 because the same anti blasphemy law for which someone in india recently got jailed has been applied on him as well because he went to a church in bombay i think where uh, you know uh, people thought that uh, jesus feet were uh, dripping water or something like that but he went there and he said oh this is capillary effect etc it's no no miraculous uh, event and so a case was filed against him for hurting the sentiments of of christians in bombay at that time and because this is a jailable offense uh, 
So he uh, went to Finland and he stays there now in protest that till you repeal this law, I will not return to the country because I will get arrested. So that's 2011. Now, every it's not even a case of what about to read that everyone who got upset about freedom of expression being quashed in the case of uh, this one comedian, let's say, well, where was this sense for you since 2011? Or at least develop it now. Can you also include Mr. Edamaru in your list of people you are concerned about? So uh, there, I think we should anyway kind of separate it and almost chalk it up to a weird political ideological situation in India today, uh, where the deeper discussion can be more fundamental than that anyway. So, but coming back, I think what you are saying raises a very important point that first of all, modern corporate technological system or culture has fooled us into thinking that we we have freedom of expression when what we are doing is the surrender of attention you know so i can go on to twitter and be on twitter all day expressing myself all day long and i do we we do right but is that freedom of expression or is that just jack dorsey hijacking our attention or is it some mix of the two where we must be cautious where the dial moves and how much it moves when uh, you know i mean just recently i read that i think facebook some internal facebook reports got revealed which showed that facebook is very aware that instagram has a toxic effect on the psychology of young teens yes. especially young teenage girls so yes a young teenage girl has a freedom of expression she can go on to instagram post anything you know and, and in, a young teenage girl in India will go on to Instagram. She'll post about, oh, how Ram is a pig or something like that, right? But that's not freedom of expression. That's just the hijacking of your time and attention by, by the institution, by the, by the thing in power, which is what I think it connects to what you were saying. So uh, number one, I'm making two points here. That number one, the idea of freedom of expression is important only when there is quashing of expression to begin with. And that was not our civilizational trajectory. But number two, in today's world, the idea, as all good ideas are, they have been twisted and subverted. And they have been hijacked by the, by you can call it the corporate technological megaplex, or I don't know what good word to use for that. But, uh, you know, it, it, we, we live in the illusion, ki are hum, uh, we are being very expressive, great rights and all. That's not the case. So all good agendas today are subverted from within. You know, the intent might be good, but I don't think in real it's happening. In real, I think it's happening in a very twisted way. So and on this, on this, India will really have to question what it wants to do and how it wants to do it. Because on this, we do not have a historical precedent. We, we did not have large monopolistic or monopolistic tendency uh, organizations with the kind of technological reach and control that we have today. And in our own civilization, we had trading guilds. So we had shared communities, which were profit making communities, uh, prosperity generating communities, but uh, they were embedded more organically into the larger whole. So what we're dealing with today is just a civilized uh, at a species level. It's a new thing. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I don't know what the answers are, but there are certainly lots of danger points that we must be cognizant of uh, on this count. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I actually asked this was that since we talk about myths and we know that, mm -hmm. let's take a very basic example because I'm taking a basic example for the viewers. Uh, I have been researching on uh, freedom of expression in my own way from a perspective of soft power and not mm. constitutional law because mm. in international law and international relations, soft power is very important. And that's something which drives more to the problem rather than constitutional law rhetoric, which to be fair enough, public law doesn't make sense in India at all. In fact, no public laws make sense at all anywhere in the world, except maybe I don't know, uh, anywhere like Singapore or some good European country. Otherwise, mm. <laughs> leave Europe and Southeast Asia, nowhere it makes sense. But mm. still, I have very harsh views on constitutional laws. So I will always say that. But let's leave that point. Uh, I, the very reason why I asked this question was, since Bharat has been civil, a civilization of that sort, there have been various communities and of course, as you pointed out, that this is something which is which could be a new experiment. I might believe that it could not be only simple, simple to the very reason that it might not be documented in the way the West does it. For example, the Salem witch case or, 
you know, the Edward Snowden issue or you start mm. with anything in the Cold War era, how freedom of expression was stifled. I mean, there are so many mm. Cold War stories. Richard can, Richard can come someday and tell us sure. about <laughs> he, he has done a he has done a master's thesis, particularly on um, all of Palmer, if people look his profile. Clearly. So uh, freedom of expression is a very different thing. Even within the Soviets, it was a different problem. But still, uh, since I said it, it is, you know, problem of power and so, so forth, power and uh, competence. One thing which I realized, and this is, I can't give a specific example, but this is from, you know, the reading of uh, some Sanskrit works, some Hindi works, basically mostly philosophy and literature, is that, uh, let's take the Natya Shastra, for example. So if you have a, point, a very clear sense to democratize expressions, and that could be also possible in Kama Sutra, that could also be possible in other literary and philosophical texts. You're giving a leeway to actually eject this from the power competence question altogether because diversity itself cannot come. When uh, diversity cannot come, when the power competence things are not clear enough. So, for example, um, uh, what I meant to say was if you are, if, for example, if you're developing a scholarship, it should be independent of the power notion altogether. The power question is a different thing, it is a strategic issue how you have to hold your power. But when you do things up, it has nothing to do with power particularly. You are actually trying to give a feedback also to you, right? You are saying, fine, Prithviraj Chauhan is a great king, blah, blah, blah. But he had his own failures. Why did he lose at the first place? But fine, mm -hmm. we have people have disagreements. They say Prithviraj Raso is not so true at all. They have their own disagreements per se. I'm not saying I have it, but people have it. So uh, the main point is that expression itself should be considered from a perspective that fine, OK? You want it, it should be dealing from the power notion altogether, and it should be truly individual. It should not be based on feudal group representations. Yeah. You give the example of one ordinary person. I can give you examples of many people. And I can say they're ordinary people, they are just not named anywhere. But again, the same issue comes in that when it is to be delinked. But then again, mm -hmm. people have to understand that if you are saying you are individual, then be please be a responsible individual. Don't be somebody yes. like fine. But I believe personally that. We never had this, collu uh, this collusion problem. We never had this uh, power dynamics when it comes to freedom of expression, I believe, because of the simple reason of the very diverse literature that we had and our uh, approaches to our social systems and the way we developed our cultural conundrums altogether. In fact, I believe even cultural economy we used to have. Of course, I'm talking about the pre-industrial times. This is my view. Uh, people might disagree with me, but maybe some more research could be done in this. So this is my view. But anyways, yeah. uh, I, I mean, yeah. just I, I wanted to add to it that uh, sure. it's almost uh, from what we've discussed about this freedom of expression in, in the last five, 10 minutes, it almost emerges that rather the problem might not even be freedom of expression, but it's about how much can the individual be free in an era when institutions are becoming more and more powerful. Uh, you know, so uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, I don't know if it's connected, but what occurred to me when you were talking about this was that something like the UPI in India, which is a fintech layer, and forgive me for using a very bad word, but it's a very secularizing layer, which ensures that, okay, there can be these institutions, but let that not mean that small players or individuals become subservient to them. So at the financial layer, the UPI does something to that to, to a degree. Now, the government currently is also working on the ONDC, right? The one uh, network for digital, uh, 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 I think, uh, co commerce or something like that. It, it, it's trying to create a layer for e-commerce, which would be equivalent to e-commerce, how UPI was to FinTech. So right now, an individual seller who sells on Amazon will have to follow a different set of rules, will have to have a different, I don't know, uh, bookkeeping or something uh, with a relation to Amazon. If that seller has to go to Flipkart, it will be a whole new process, uh, a whole new system. And these will be two different agencies with different rules, etc. But the ONDC would try to bring in a layer where it's one framework. And using that framework, a seller can sell on any e-commerce marketplace in the country. So that, again, I think is a kind of secularizing layer where the individual units will not become subservient and surrendered to the institutional holes, which are becoming larger and larger. So, I mean, I, I, I know it does take away from where we started at freedom of expression, but somehow it just felt that this was a bit connected to what we were discussing. Actually, uh, I understand. 
the um, a, a UPI is a part of your India stack project. So basically, Aadhaar, UPI, all of these come under the same framework. Uh, I have severe disagreements with the efficacy of Aadhaar, although Aadhaar is a very good idea. Let's be honest. By the UPI government, ironically, uh, followed by the NDA government very well. But uh, uh, UPI is something which is a fintech wonder because of many reasons when it comes to, you know, how it provides accessibility to people. So it's something which is uniquely Indian in the sense that uh, it gives mm -hmm. opportunities to MSMEs. And that's something which uh, is a very structuralized achievement for us. Now, uh, let's see, maybe in another episode or maybe in another discussion, if we come up with something, we can discuss more about content hostage and freedom of expression. Because if we keep discussing about this, it will be too long. Right. And already we have crossed an arc. But anyways, yeah, I'll continue with the discussion until it ends. So now you cover a particular section on leadership. And uh, I found it very interesting like others. So my question is that, uh, and it's a long one. Uh, and I'm not, uh, my one caution is that I am particularly not interested in the you know, the pre-industrial understandings, particularly here as to, you know, how the systems have been perfect or not with respect to identity as how people understand. But it's from a perspective of what is to be understood today. Of course, linking it, but not directly. Is that fine? Uh, P, uh, you stated about, you know, that people say, fine, uh, Trump and Modi are not considered Democrats. They're considered mm -hmm. the F word thing. And mm -hmm. uh, 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 there's a particular problem with it because of the simple reason that uh, both Trump and Modi have a simple thing that they follow democratic realism to some extent, uh, mm -hmm. ironically, uh, which is something common to them, ironically. Now, uh, Donald Trump does it because of the frustrations in the United States public. And they are where he basically cautions down the Republican approach to America. And he also, you know, tones down the Judeo-Christian people that fine, you know, mm -hmm. you what you want to have your autonomy, fine. Let's be respectful and also get some work done. That's something which uh, Donald Trump did very well better than other Republican presidents. With, uh, with the current prime minister in India, the interesting part is that he goes for democratic uh, uh, realism from a perspective that fine, many governments have come in, they have demanded for Vikas, but they have not been able to do it because fine, Vikas has been an agenda for many prime ministers since Nehru to many. And uh, why am I pointing that out? Is because of the question of leadership so my specific question is and i mm -hmm. know that uh, it's a long it could be a long one that no, it's good to set the context yeah yeah so let us say there are tributaries of you know various tribal and political cultural relationships i call everyone tribe i'm not talking about the legal definition you know schedule mm -hmm. caste or obc and all of that i'm not getting into it i'm saying let us say mm -hmm. tribes in a very simple fashion in a colloquial manner mm -hmm. i'm not saying anyone in that sense so let's say they are tributaries of tribal and political cultural relationships. Now, ironically, what is generally seen, and it is my observation again, is that most of the identity politics, which is based on any identity, I'm not going to name the identity and I'm not interested to do even name that. Most of them we have been converted into abstract notions of power. Were they mm -hmm. is always a bigger question. Were they exactly like that is also another question. So these are the two sub questions I have for you. I consider they were not because of the simple reason that, again, we were a very federal civilization. Yes, there was a sense of consciousness, but consciousness and power are a different question. Linking identity and power is a very dangerous question alto thing altogether. That hmm. whether happened is something which is uh, something I do, do not realize that could be there for now. It could be there. It could not be there. But I generally do not hmm. think it has been there because of colonialism. It has actually happened. So now people hmm. think, fine, we have an identity politics, we have a representation, we have an electoral vote and blah, blah, blah. We have this, this influence and systemic stuff and blah, blah, blah. But in general, uh, uh, despite having so many complex systems, because yes, complexity was there. Uh, uh, in general, for anyone who is not experiencing it, it will be complex for some who is experiencing it. It was very easy for them. It's like something like a cakewalk. But hmm. since uh, it this identity politics was fashioned in a colonized way since the British era, ironically, which because uh, it could not happen in the way when the Turkic and Arabic invasions happened in India. I don't think Arabic, but Turkic mostly, let's say. I may be wrong on that. That's why I'm saying Turkic mostly. Um, uh, because history is not my forte. Uh, India generally never had an ideological approach towards collective consciousness and dharma. Yeah. Yeah. Even if 
a sense of unison was there dharma was the uniting feature of course but uh, to say that fine uh, uh, i mean uh, i would not mention dayana ek for fun but i'll say <laughs> that uh, uh, <laughs> i'll say that pilgrimage sites for example as she mentioned that's the best same example i can give anyone who has who's watching for the first time or doesn't know about indian history or indian culture pilgrimage sites used to be a very interesting thing fine you went to char dham you you know kedarnath badrinath and so on i've been to there of course to the prayag pit prayag that has been an amazing journey as well as spiritually amazing but that's a different discussion altogether but but main point is since dharma has been that collective consciousness portion per se there has not been an ideological approach which has been seen the ideological approach came only after one uh, one particular work in the uh, you know the late 19th century and then which was exacer- exacerbated in a proper way by uh, savarkar and of course others so i'm not getting on savarkarites and savarkar's thought but i'm only getting on the question as to if we see uh, dharma in that sense should we link dharma uh, with the notions of pa- uh, notions of power governance or not or we should only see dharma from a notion of competence and responsibility because this these tribal and political cultural relationships have not been very much attributed to identity politics so this is my uh, question so very simple question because again question identity politics is a very well imp- it's not that people don't do it today people do it of course it is of course people do it the problem is from whom you emulate now of course there can be pros and cons of it indians might do it in a different way i can give examples of jalalita or any other politician who have done in a very interesting way people might disagree mm. with that or agree with that but still generally i uh, generally it could be said it, it is it or it is not so what do you think uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, so you know uh, i think it is uh, km munshi ji uh, who alluded to the fact that first of all a nation is what the people believe it is you know and and he was so he was alluding to the bottom up uh, feeling of what a nation is of course you can from the top down define a constitution you can have a monarchy and that will give your nation the structure now uh, 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 so sai deepak's book also you know india that is bharat and uh, it, it's it's uh, the fact that today in t- 2021 we st- still need a book that reminds us of the same truth that our constitution begins with uh, is evidence to the fact that top down uh, is not permanent and is not a given you will have to keep reminding people of the bottom up now uh, you know i think this is uh, something david frawley ji also mentioned in a video somewhere that uh, the fundamental problem first of all in india today is that there are two kinds of indians one there are indians who believe in the india that was born in 1947 it has a constitution it's a secular socialist constitution and sure they may give a few centuries of preamble to this india now there are some people who over and above believing in this india also believe in something called bharat which that first set doesn't actually believe in that first set denies it exists that first set says that talking of that is revisionism or hindu fantasy or things like that now between india and bharat actually i will add one more entity which is hindustan so there are many in india who will say that the moguls are nation builders who will talk to us about ganga jamuni tehzeeb you know who will lap up books by white women authors on tyrannical uh, turkic rulers like aurangzeb so actually we are india hindustan and bharat and everyone who believes in india yes also believes that hindustan existed and uh, uh, sorry everyone who believes in bharat knows that there is a hindustan and an india everyone who believes in hindustan knows that there is an india but it denies the bharat and everyone who just believes india probably denies both the previous two now before we can fix i will add something issue, on that since you said please. denial i think uh, uh, even if they are not poised to deny i'm not saying they are not denying because some people even i have experienced to do even if they are not poised to deny they are not even poised to accept it so it's they are not denying yes. but they are not even to accept it at the same time it's a, yes. it's a, yes. it's or a paradox ignorance situation. anyway yes kind of yes. yeah kind of yeah. so with this being the reality of the indian people which is to say that together anyway we don't believe in being that we are one nation and if we do then we are split into what that nation is uh, and i think 
it is fair to say that perhaps this has always been true even in our past so dharma or our sacred geography or these pilgrimage sites it was an endeavor or by some people who already believed in that bharat to create it and articulate it such that others could also absorb it and inherit it now because for the past 1000 years at least our own trajectory has been hijacked and it's been in in the control of foreigners we don't know uh, how we could have uh, uh, developed on this path and whether that consciousness could have seeped well whether that identity building given 1000 years of of strong uh, autonomous development uh, could it have generated you know a bharat that uh, of, of our fantasies so to speak you know so we don't know that it's speculative territory we don't know the mind of chandragupt gupt or of skanda gupt like what did they think of as these monarchs did they believe in a bharat were they working with some kind of nation building pride or were they actually just imperial monarchs who happened to build great empires you know we can guess to the mind of chandragupt maurya through what we read of of kautilya and chanakya but kautilya and chanakya also i mean uh, was he building a bharat i i i am not familiar on the content here but does he talk about building this this nation called bharat or is he talking about keeping the empire secure about what are the hard truths and hard things that need to be done in order to maintain and govern so that consciousness we don't know when how deeply and with what reach it existed we will have to build it and uh, that's the hope right of course uh, i think uh, many people who would be tinkering about this question these questions generally i raise i only wish to raise this question for the simple list of the reasons that fine please do your research come up with something sensible mm -hmm. and show mm -hmm. actually how it works or how does it not work good i mean uh i remember that uh, there was some particular podcast i'll not mention the podcast and uh, somebody very interestingly argued why india was not able to handle the turkic invasions and what issues were there and of course mm -hmm. i'll not name the particular person who did it but somebody some intellectual did it so congratulations to the person now uh you mention about the concept of rit within the amrit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you say it could be different i am not right but it could be different uh here you say rit as the eternal order of reality mm -hmm. so my simplest question is and this is a very uh, not speculative but uh, an, a very ontological question so if you say that rit is the eternal order of reality and you say that you know the naturalist civilization and so forth uh can it be understood or at least ascertained for a while that mm -hmm. uh, dharma is that naturalist algorithm and i'm not saying algorithm from a perspective of hardcore electronics i'm saying from a perspective of you know ecosystems of working and how the phenomena works because in economics also you go with phenomena and uh, uh, not the newtonian approach of technological materialism so dharma is not materialist dharma is more naturalist in that sense so can we say because many uh, dharmic thinkers i know have been arguing on the naturalized aspect of, the, of dharma that you know india is a natural civilization not an artificial civilization its civilizational identity is naturalist therefore yeah. so 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 uh, do you think that question number 1 dharma is that naturalist algorithm can it be understood according to your model and at the same time is rit the word rit mm -hmm. uh, which you call as eternal order of reality is naturally algorithmic by nature one of them could be true according to me so because i believe that dharma seems to be a naturalist procession procession of ethical paradigms uh, of uh, you know the bharatiya civilization per se the federal civilization per se so how do you see that and you know you can give your ontological views on it as per, as per your model modular approach mm -hmm. Uh, well first so i mean i will not claim this is my model per se shout out in particular to three twitter handles vakips samanya jeevi and bhumi putra uh, a lot of the ideas about dharma and rit that i am coming to are uh, absorbing so much that they tweet about that they write about and in fact samanya jeevi also has a blog that's literally called rut and dharma so he's been about this uh, for a very long time in fact 
So uh, now uh, I, I can give a very specific example to uh, illustrate what I mean. So, uh, you know, mushrooms, uh, mushrooms grow with this flowering bloom bud above the ground. But beneath the ground surface, they have this elaborate mycelium network, which is the network through which they distribute all of their nutrients. And you can say through which they communicate, etc. So the health of the system, whether it needs more light, where it needs more water, etc. All of that is being communicated through the mycelium. Now, in uh, uh, Tokyo, I believe this was an experiment that was done that scientists did some experiments on these mycelium networks in order to see how which are the most efficient ways to transport uh, uh, nutrients etc through a very densely packed network and they were doing this in order to increase the efficiency of the tokyo subway system so they looked at how the mycelium behaved tried to find some learnings on how to manage dense flow and implemented that in the Tokyo subway system. Now, the model I am talking about, Rith is the mycelium. Dharma is the Tokyo subway system that emerges after having looked at the mycelium. So this is what I mean that Dharma is the Indian attempt to conduct life and society in consonance with Rith. Rith is existent. It is already there. And yes, it is. So I wouldn't say dharma is the naturalist algorithm. Dharma is the algorithm we are trying to create in order to be in consonance with the naturalist uh, natural uh, algorithm, which is Rith. Uh, and uh, in so, fact, there is this. So interestingly, Please. just one intervention. So Please. you're saying that dharma is something which we are particularly. So it's, it's a human case, of course. It's a Manavia case. Mm -hmm. Let's say in yes. uh, in, the, in in a, in a uh, I mean, yeah, with due, due respect yeah. to the aparusheya uh, and uh, anadi aspects of dharma, but yes, uh -huh. because I was going to ask for that. But um, uh, let's say uh, so. Uh, according to you, Rita is the particular order, and dharma is uh, so. Uh, Rita is the naturalist algorithm per se, and not dharma. That's a very interesting yeah. point. Now you can continue. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, and, and so even uh, take the Tokyo subway system. So, OK, let us say they took the knowledge of mycelium and embedded it into the Tokyo subway system. So that knowledge is eternal. Sure, it's anadi, it's it's our parushaya. But the application uh, is a human application and it is therefore a, a tangible application. So which is why I mean, and I'm not an expert here. So these are my my own uh, thoughts uh, being expressed aloud. That's why I'm just drawing this distinction between Rit and Dharma. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah. So, uh, what, sorry, I was just making the point that there is this yeah, book yeah. Uh, by uh, by Max Tegmark. It's called Our Mathematical Universe. So he's uh, this new Platonian theoretical physicist, and he makes the <laughs> argument that all well by his own description. So uh, this is not words <laughs> me putting words into his mouth. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, so he makes the argument that all of reality is a mathematical equation. Uh, you know, and so it. It, that's it, the language may be different, but I think in terms of how the imagery is being formed in the head, he's also talking about a natural algorithm. And uh, we, our ancestors were calling that Rith, for example. And Plato was calling that, I don't know what. So, so he gave me the example of Max Tregmark. He's also known in the field of AI ethics for his own works. But uh, yeah. So he's a pre generally known in his work in machine learning ethics, and right, right, uh, right. he has been more more talking about you know the role of AI and responsible AI mm, and okay. so forth. Mm. So he's mostly known in that. But of course, he's from physics and mathematics generally. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. mostly he's from mathematics, but because many mathematicians like Andrew Ng and all of those talk about artificial intelligence ethics, they even work on mm -hmm. that. Now, um, very interesting point you made. I think uh, I would very much declare now. That this episode is a hypothesis discussion as if mm -hmm. somebody is proposing their phd thesis and although i don't consider <laughs> myself to be a phd i'm not a phd particularly and but i'm saying I. i'm like the, the guide so consider it like a hypothesis discussion where somebody mm -hmm. is coming and discussing the hypothesis people can disagree with it there is no issue with that absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, these particular episodes of interesting are more about fascination fascinated ideas which make sense uh, yeah. that's why we invite so yeah, and there's freedom now, of expression so <laughs> kind of because uh, yeah. no linkage with the notion <laughs> very nicely put there's out, no, no power structure yeah. imposing itself 
yeah 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 of course um now um the very uh, last point which i wish to make in is uh which is the last question is regarding uh, uh, the indra vadun hymns mm-hmm. so taking the example of vashishtha's indra vadun hymns if you can elaborate upon that for the viewers also mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how do you examine the bharatiya ethos and uh, mm-hmm. yes if you say revival should be sought then how could it have very reasonable policy implications when it comes to two things human development and quality of life because there actually it when it resonates very possibly what will happen is that the ethos will actually increase more and it will not just increase it will stabilize in a better way there are, mm-hmm. because we all know that uh, as you said the hindustan and india uh, connect is being acknowledged but the mm-hmm. bharatiya connect is not being acknowledged and that yeah. has a lot to do with economy and human development lack of human development and many issues mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. uh how do you see this now if you can elaborate uh, so uh i mean if we are talking about how all of this projects on to india today and for our problems today then yes i do come back to uh, you know there is no happy jan without happy jeeves so yes exactly as you said quality of life etc so our focus right now in in a practical in a governance sense we, we can have people like me armchair wannabe ideologues talking about you know civilizational trajectory and all of that that's great and this is good good to ha- add to the manthan that is bharat right now but in the real and tangible sense uh, we need uh, uh, you know uh, good economy we need good good infrastructure uh, good quality of life so if we have to root it to something uh, indic then i think the purusharthas are the way to root it but it is also true that uh, every layer of our society and civilization right now is so ruptured and it's so you know disrupted from what it once was which it has forgotten anyway and what it remembers are false and implanted memories to begin with so it's not like we can you know just pick up things from our past Uh, apply them here and think that yes that's that's it that it's going to work because the past we're talking about is a past 30 40 generations removed from us uh, at 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 the very least and in fact when we talk about rigved purans then it's what it's 60 100 generations removed from us at the very least so it 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 doesn't have applicative ability right now uh, it has philosophical relevance right now which will become salient once the baseline of india being economically financially infrastructurally educationally health wise sanitation all of those things are are you know you know so i mean in a very relevant sense you know swachh bharat is more important right now than uh, you know a textbook on ancient indian history for example right so yeah i mean that's what i feel about it and once that happens then i think indians will anyway start to look back to their own ethos you know india is the kind of thing i do think you know it's possibly the only thing in the world that people come to on their own and and take from on their own and surrender to on their own you know i mean so many foreigners keep coming to india and starting to they just settle down in a dharmshala somewhere etc this doesn't happen anywhere else in the world so when we still have a dharma vriksh that is so strong that it's pulling foreigners back to in, uh, foreigners not back foreigners to india then i think it will certainly pull us back okay you need to tell me what's funny though <laughs> yeah so i do, mean, I, I do, do think continue. that so i do think that uh, once the janas the, the sorry the jeeves the individuals are happy fulfilled prosperous then we will start looking back to our own history our own culture uh, much better uh, i mean yes uh, and the, uh, the colonization problem is salient over here right i mean we're all educated to hate our culture our ancestors Uh, crudely speaking to to spit on them so to speak you know i myself uh, i mean for the longest time i just hated my ancestors for being some kind of brahmin hegemons you know until i knew better right so that's not a nice state to be in and how can an individual ever connect with their collective if they are so ruptured and you know uh, disconnected from their own roots so uh, but yes uh, once india itself is empowered etc then i think we might see changes there the education part will have to be fixed because otherwise we'll just get elites who still uh, continue to spit on india uh, for validation of someone else uh i was actually Wait, what, what was the joke 
joke nothing you mentioned about foreigners that i just felt for nothing just a joke right i remember many movies in which uh, foreigners have come to india they have stayed and you know some yeah. good stories some bad stories so sure, came into sure, my mind of course yeah anyway, i mean the so, israelis uh, you know the the entire yeah. actually goa and uh, goa and uh, kasol how did these actually rise uh, to the to fame you know it's israelis after finishing their military service mandatory military service started coming to goa and then going to himachal etc and uh, they found something here that would help them make sense of the post traumatic stress disorder that they were going through after you know having lived a military life from the age of 18 to 20 etc you know young kids actually right so but then they found a soul here uh, in some cases and they found uh, destruction also through other things so yeah it's both ways indeed so uh, i think i would say that uh, we really had an interesting discussion and uh, this is one of the discussions we had we will have more with others and of course with you in future if possible and uh, the larger idea was to involve people with a sense of clarity that fine there are some x y z things but if you are coming up with an idea you need to see where you can come up with so this is one of the attempts we are trying that fine everybody talks about bhartiya civilization bhartiya civilizational uh, let's bring this back bring that back yep. fine yes okay takes time very good what do you want to do next because mm-hmm. again uh, uh, the same question will come in that uh, revival is not uh, because as aurobindo says usually and aurobindo's views are accorded in that regard that bharat like asia is very much immortal uh, it, it represents immortality uh, whereas uh, with for the west he has said and it is not my words it is his words that the west represents a kind of an exit always an exit a linear exit from something which it always has been so hmm. with this note yeah. uh uh this is something uh, that okay fine we want to be immortal then we need to think of an immortal machination of ourselves which actually makes sense and of course uh, as we revive we have to rejuvenate also that is how we own the world and that is how we instill you know a bharatiya approach to globe the globe and of course a bharatiya approach to india both at the same time so with this yeah, we mean, uh, end uh, on this, this note if i could shot, just uh, right, just okay. uh, Uh, because you just sure, mentioned sure, sure, that you know uh, as you said that uh, it's all very good to keep saying that yes bring civilization back bring civilization back but then what next so on this note i must submit to you that it is your forum uh, people such as you kartikeya ruchir uh, alexi uh, uh, kiran uh, for me once i saw the civilization past etc it's on this forum that i i i also realized that okay it's all good to keep beating that uh, drum but uh, then now what next what about po- policy formulations what about geopolitics what about how to manage the economy then these are questions and answers to these questions that uh, your forum and uh, people that come on your forum uh, and now i follow most of them on twitter anyway so so thank you for that and uh, for uh, awakening me also to that reality and that need rather really grateful to know that <laughs> so with this <coughs> we conclude this session of in this thing we hope that you everybody who is who has watched this really likes this session uh amrit is available on twitter you can give his your your precious comments please be nice and decent to him he is available <laughs> at the rate amritanshu uh, i i don't uh, mind uh, indecent yeah. also it's okay it's fun Fine. <laughs> of course <laughs> your choice but yeah my ma- masala bhi milna chahiye yaar time to time it's okay <laughs> <laughs> anyway i mean uh, <laughs> if masala is common in life anyways so yeah. <laughs> we have we always had those spices it remember reminds me of one uh, very so since you said masala one thing to end with somebody said that uh, when the british came to india they were so fond of spices and their fondness mm-hmm. of spices because spice was such a common commodity in india we never cared too much about it because it was like fine chalo chalta hai mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. even we, when we don't have scarcity of spices we of course have a hell lot of them this still have become too greedy of it so it's a very weird and hmm. funny phenomenon when it comes to culinary <laughs> issues so ki matlab khane mein zyada mirchi dalte type so it's like that so right, right. anyways hmm. with that uh, funny note we end it please follow amritan shu at uh, uh, at rate amritan shu uh, i would say underscore soa on yeah. twitter uh, follow me at the rate indus think uh, do watch us as we come up with more episodes of indus think and uh, let's see we will be coming up with our panel discussions and of course these dialogues uh, uh we we have also started 
Kavyanjali specials, which is a very different mm -hmm. kind of thing altogether. So we are trying to feature Indo-European artists across the globe and also in India with some podcasts, not necessarily with musical performances. So one, they can be a part of our episodes. And two, if they wish to give some performances, they can do on a platform. Uh, nice. Even by chance, I write poems both in Hindi and English. So I would be very happy to present my poems. I just did it one on uh, the 14th of September, which is um, Jalagari Kasparsh. So those who wish to watch and listen the poem, because it's not a rhyming poem, it's your usual mm. uh, sanskrit -ish Hindi boring poem. So if people who wish to listen to it with a musical experience, please go there, listen to it. And yes, give your feedback. Let's see what you think of the poem. Uh, I would be really happy to know that. Till then, we end this session. And uh, thank you so much to everyone. Namaste. Thank you.